Two brothers who were sexually abused by an Anglican priest have waived their right to anonymity to criticise the Church of England's failure to protect them. Phil and Gary Johnson from Eastbourne were abused by the Reverend Roy Cotton in the 70s and 80s, even though the church knew that he was a convicted paedophile. The way their cases have been handled has prompted an independent inquiry by a former judge and we've obtained a report by a victim support group claiming the church continues to minimise or deny the true extent of child abuse. Our Home Affairs correspondent Colin Campbell has this exclusive report. As boys they suffered at the hands of a predatory paedophile, a parish priest who the church knew was a convicted child abuser. Being abused is bad enough. Being abused by someone in such a position of authority means that you don't, I don't trust doctors, I don't trust the police, I don't trust anyone in a position of authority. I don't trust men. An angelic choir boy, Phil never knew his younger brother was being abused until they were adults. I just felt horrible. I just felt completely responsible. I felt as though, you know, I could have prevented this from happening to him and, and hadn't done so. Desperate to stop Roy Cotton, the brothers went to the police in 1996. Other victims came forward in later years, but Roy Cotton was allowed to continue his priestly duties up until his death in 2006. I just felt a bit cheated, really, that he died and managed to get away with it. You know, if, if he'd have lived a bit longer, he'd have been in prison. Phil and Gary were groomed and systematically sexually abused here in Eastbourne in the 1970s and 80s. The abuse was extreme and prolonged, and at least eight others were targeted by Roy Cotton. This report by an organisation which supports victims of clergy sexual abuse suggests Gary and Phil's treatment is far from isolated. 21 victims of sexual abuse by priests from 14 Anglican dioceses responded to the Maxas survey. The organisation says the replies indicate that few, if any, effective actions appear to have been taken to ensure that the alleged abusers, vicars and other clergy, do not pose a risk to other children and that this failure to act to protect children has been reflected time and again within the Church of England. The priority seems to be to protect the church rather than to protect the children. And even though there's good intentions, what we're finding is that when they try and put these into practice, overwhelmingly, it is the um, protection of the church that seems to come paramount and the protection of the vicars, in many cases, who have abused the children. A second independent inquiry into the failings surrounding the abuse suffered by Phil and Gary Johnson is underway. Baroness Butler Sloss, who was the country's highest ranking female judge, will publish her findings very soon. I'm not ashamed. I've been ashamed too long. I've carried the guilt of this for too long. Um, and I want anyone else out there who's in the shadows, who's in pain, to know that there's nothing to be afraid of. Um, there will be people out there to help you, even if it's not the people who abused you or the institutions responsible. There are people who can help. And the sooner you start on that journey, the sooner you get something of your life back. The Diocese of Chichester says it's committed to ensuring the safety of all children in its care and has put in place a wide range of safeguards over many years. Phil and Gary have received an apology from the church but say the abuse they suffered continues to haunt their lives. Colin Campbell, BBC South East Today, Eastbourne. Well, we asked the Diocese of just, just Chichester if they'd like to talk to us this evening, but they declined our offer until the completion of the inquiry that Colin mentioned there. But we are joined live from Westminster by Anne Lawrence of the Victim Support Group Ministry and Clergy Sexual Abuse Survivors. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. The church says that it takes every allegation of abuse seriously and that it is committed to ensuring the safety of all of the children in its care. Do you feel that it is managing to do that now? Currently it's not managing to do that. Um, what we found from our survey and from talking to many victims who phoned the Maxis helpline is that time and again when victims have come to the church they've either been disregarded or the church has been um, content to rely upon the criminal justice system to determine whether these allegations are true. Now that may not seem to be such a scandalous omission but very few children, in fact, are ever, um, very few offenders, I'm sorry, are ever convicted 
of child sex offences. And so the churches themselves need to have in place very strong safeguarding procedures. So what do they need to do? What exactly do they need to put in place to make sure that happens? They need to have consistent procedures. At the moment, the way that the procedures have been drafted in the Church of England is far too wide to allow for consistency. All offenders need to be mandatorily assessed to determine what risks they may pose to children if they have had previous allegations of child abuse. What we know is that there are a number of vicars in this country who continue in parish ministry and some of them have 14 allegations of child abuse against them. Because no conviction has been brought, the church seems to be, the authorities seem to be content um, to rely upon that to let them continue in ministry. And you've been making recommendations to the independent investigation. Uh, what are you anticipating to see in the report that comes out of that? Well, we're hoping to see a firming up of those procedures. We would like to see uh, mandatory steps taken and effective actions taken where there are serious allegations of child abuse made. And we would like to see that apply consistently across dioceses. OK, Anne Lawrence, thank you very much for thank joining you. us.